The chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, has revealed that the new Electoral Act would require all political parties to carry out their primaries six months before the general elections. Now, joining us to tell us more about this is the Director of Voter Education uh, at INEC, talking about uh, Mr. Nick Dazang. Thank you very much, Mr. Dazang, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Perfect. Um, for To the common person, to the layman, um, explain to us that clause, because we know that before it used to be three months before uh, the elections, um, the parties, political parties were given three months to organize their primaries and, you know, clean up and send their names to INEC before elections. But now it has been increased to six months. Um, what prompted this amendment and why is it necessary? What good will it do to the electoral process? Thank you very much. Um, if you look at the Electoral Act Section 31, um, it gives the political parties actually 60 days, that is two months, to nominate candidates and to submit the list of candidates to the Independent National Electoral Commission uh, before the conduct of the election. And the timetable and schedule of activities for the conduct of presidential and governorship elections uh, allows for elections to take place 90 days after the notice for such an election uh, has been issued by the commission. Now, if this is amended and it allows for 180 days, uh, it, it has many implications and advantages uh, for the election management body, which is INEC and the political parties. First of all, what it means is that uh, the political parties will have ample time uh, to conduct their primaries, to submit the candidates, to resolve uh, disputes arising from the primaries that they have conducted. That is number one. Number two, it will also give INEC uh, sufficient time uh, for it to accept these candidates after the disputes have been resolved, and then for it to print uh, ballot papers uh, for uh, these political parties in good time. Now, if you look at what happened in the 2019 general elections, we had 91 registered political parties on the ballot. And printing those ballots within the short time that was allowed by the, by the law uh, resulted in a logistics nightmare for the commission. I was privileged to conduct the general elections in the FCT. And in the FCT alone, the quantity or, or, or the, the, the quantum of uh, paper that we received for each election amounted to about 21 trucks uh, that we had to receive uh, from the vaults of the CBN. We had to now, uh, you know, sort them out and distribute them to the six area councils of the FCT. Now, you can imagine if you are conducting such an election in a state like Lagos or Kano, where we have 44 local governments, Oh, Kaduna, where we have 23 local governments, the kind of uh, challenges, the logistics challenges that we pose. Mm. So that will give us ample time uh, to print these ballots in good time, to distribute them, keep them in the vaults of the uh, Central Bank of Nigeria in advance of the conduct of the elections. And then what we face is the logistics, you know, on election day. That's number two. Number three. Um, you know, if you look at what happened in 2015, even though uh, the election of 2015 was acclaimed and praised, uh, you know, and people thought it surpassed the conduct of 2011, we still had 180 uh, court cases arising from the primaries, you know, that led to the conduct of the 2015 general elections. And at the end of the day, you know, the election under the watch of Professor Mahmoud Yakubu conducted 60 ordered, court ordered elections arising from primaries that were not resolved, you know, in the 2015 general elections. Now, the, this cost millions to taxpayers. I was about to ask so that question. Uh, that have been avoided. I was about to ask the question that how much money is this going to save for you because of the expenses when I think about 
having to we reconduct these at, elections. We are looking at money in hundreds of millions that will be saved uh, for the taxpayers. I'm not even looking at billions because it's possible for it to reach uh, billions if you have so many uh, uh, court cases uh, and, and then at the end of the day, uh, the, the courts order the commission to repeat these elections. And now you are not looking also at the expenses, uh, you know, incurred by the political parties, by the candidates, by members of civil society whose remit it, it is to observe the conduct of the elections, mm. uh, development partners who invest hundreds of millions in the conduct of these elections, the media uh, who also observe and report the conduct of this election. So a lot would have been saved in terms of money, in terms of resources, in terms of time. Okay, let's talk about um, the election calendar. Will this also affect the election calendar? Because we know we, I mean, Niger State is about to do another small election, you know, in, in two local government areas. And then we also know that the election calendar is not what it used to be because of all these changes and court cases and disagreements either within the political parties that ends up in court will this new change affect a change also in the election calendar will there be any such thing no it, it no it it won't until the, the bill until this bill has been signed and it becomes an act it becomes a law but uh, before then we we have to to conduct elections with with the electoral laws as they they subsist you know, the extant laws uh, have to be amended, the laws have to be passed and signed. It is then you begin to implement or test them. But for now, we have not reached that uh, position. So we are awaiting uh, the, 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 pass the passage of the bill by the National Assembly and then the assenting to this bill by the executive. And once that is done, then we begin in earnest, you know, to implement the, the, the laws that have been amended including this particular clause, you know, uh, at issue. Uh, so for now, we are going uh, with the Electoral Act 2010 as amended. But at the end of the day, we'll, uh, the, the, I think what the National Assembly intends to do is to bring all the amendments together and then put them into one particular booklet and then issue it out, you know, as the new set of uh, electoral laws. And then we begin to implement them. Uh, but like I observed, uh, it is going to um, solve a lot of logistics nightmares on the part of the commission. It is going to reduce a lot of costs. Mm -hmm. It is going to facilitate the resolution of disputes arising from primaries. And uh, perhaps uh, it will also spur or, you know, uh, galvanize the political parties to begin to observe internal democracy. I'm going to come to that, but let's quickly take a look at um, something, a, a little bit of the speech that was given by the INEC chairman at that event where um, this new clause was um, presented to the press. We'll be back and we'll talk more uh, about political parties. One of the provisions that actually excites me a lot is it helps the commission if there is certainty in the way we prepare for elections. And the uh, new section uh, 29, subsection 1, now commits political parties to conducting their primaries 180 days to the date appointed by the um, Commission for Elections. Meaning that parties will conduct their primaries and submit the names of their candidates to the Commission at least six months to the next general election. This will enormously help us such that uh, by, say, two months to the election, probably all our materials will be in location. Now, let's talk more about the internal democracy that you mentioned, Mr. Dazang, uh, about political parties in Nigeria. Now, there are people, um, CSOs, there are NGOs that have been on the cases of um, political, major political parties in this country about election financing. There obviously is a cap, I mean, uh, even in the 2010 Electoral Act as amended, as to how much money political parties are supposed to spend and where these monies should stop. But have they adhered to it over the years? And um, looking at this, who's really checking these political parties, other than the likes of Serap and a few other people who scream blue murder, who's really checking these political parties to make sure that these laws or the Electoral Act is followed to, uh, in its entirety? 
Well, apart from Serap that you mentioned, the political party, I mean, the, the Independent National Electoral Commission has a vibrant department uh, which limit it is to surveil or to monitor the activities of political parties. And in that particular department, we have uh, units or divisions rather, uh, which also, you know, um, take a look at, you know, finance campaign using checklists, using strategies to confirm, you know, the expenses incurred by candidates and political parties. Now, um, the issue or the area of uh, can, uh, finance, uh, campaign finance, uh, even in the developed uh, democracies, is work in progress. It is uh, uh, something that politicians have always exploited. You know, they have taken advantage of the loopholes and election management bodies, you know, have uh, tried assiduously to also plug these loopholes. And um, since uh, 20, 2007, uh, the Commission has assiduously worked towards, uh, first of all, putting a ceiling on what a candidate spends and then devising strategies, you know, to monitor the expenses incurred by candidates and political parties. And also the law insists also that um, the accounts of political parties must be audited. And once these accounts are audited, they are published. Now. These are all transparency and accountancy uh, measures uh, put in place by, by the commission. And by and by, we'll see, uh, you know, incremental um, developments in that area, you know, as we, we um, get more expertise in this area, as we get more exposure and as, you know, we improve our democracy, we'll also, the, the commission will rise to the challenge of taking these expenses and holding the political parties to account. And um, in this area, the, the civil society organizations and the media have roles to play uh, in the sense that uh, the CSOs and the media uh, are expected to call governments and even the commission to account. And um, the media can use the instrumentality of um, laws such as the uh, Freedom of Information Act to compel political parties to compel even the commission uh, to make information available to it uh, in all spheres. So well, Mr. Dazang, let me shock that, you. In 2015, by by, 2015 the election, Sarah used the power of the FOI to ask political parties, especially the APC and the PDP, to make their accounts known. Up until today, mm -hmm. that matter is still in court. So again, it makes, it makes us really wonder if these laws have any powers, if these acts have any powers, or these political parties and their politicians feel like, you know, they're above the law. Because as we speak, political no, parties no, are I, still... I, I think, um, I think um, what, what you need to appreciate is that all stakeholders in the process, uh, the, the election management body, which is INEX, civil society, the media, the judiciary, they all have roles to play you know, in um, putting in place a process that is transparent, a process that is uh, accountable. And that is why um, our own uh, dispensation allows for, you know, election tribunals to adjudicate over the conduct of elections. In other jurisdictions, uh, this do not obtain. But in our own case, the framers of the Constitution um, deliberately put the judiciary in a position to adjudicate and arbitrate over the conduct of elections. And that is why um, two weeks to the conduct of each general election, the president of the Court of Appeal issues directives, court directives as to how the, uh, the tribunals, election tribunals, the Court of Appeal, uh, you know, are going to proceed with the conduct of uh, or, or adjudication of um, uh, cases arising from the conduct of elections. So the election management body, the media, the civil society, the judiciary all have roles to play. And working in concert diligently and transparently, I believe that uh, we will have a process, you know, that um, uh, is excellent and is unsurpassed. But like I said, it is work in progress. We have to work towards it. We should not be discouraged that uh, a case, you know, in court is still pending. By and by, 
um, the, 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 judicial, the, the judiciary will come along and they will do the needful. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, Section 92 to 102 in the Electoral Act of 2010 as amended. Um, it makes provision relating to campaigns by political parties and expected conduct during these campaigns. But we see a lot of anomalies during these campaigns and no penalties. Will, we, will this be changing going forward, especially as we're getting ready for 2023? I, 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 you know, there have been penalties, but unfortunately, um, some of these penalties are not given the kind of uh, publicity or coverage uh, that the commission uh, would have loved. Uh, for example, I know that certain radio stations were in breach of that section and, and they were penalized. But uh, very few media houses, you know, called the attention of the public to that. And people need to also make a distinction as to when these expenses begin and when they end. The expenses begin when they notice, you know, for the conduct of an election as we issued 90 days to the conduct of that election. And, um, and it ends 24 hours to the conduct of the election. So people need to also know that this is the time frame uh, which the, the commission is monitoring. This might not be the kind of question that you were expecting, but the media shouldn't be made to take the fall because half the time the media takes the fall. There has to be a form of responsibilities on the part of these political parties also, not necessarily just the media. Um, they have also have to bear the brunt, but most times, as you have also alluded to, most times the media has to take the fall for these things when political parties themselves know what the Electoral Act, as amended, says and states. Yes, I'm not uh, passing the book at all. What I'm trying to say is that um, we need to hold all um, uh, critical stakeholders in this process to account. Um, it's not enough to hold INEC to account. Uh, we have seen the, uh, the tremendous uh, progress that has been made on the electoral front by holding INEC to account, by making sure it is transparent. Uh, and um, INEC has brought about so many innovations in spite of uh, the constraints. And we need to have these kinds of reforms that um, INEC has brought to bear in its conduct uh, with the political parties. Uh, let me give you an example. Oh, we're, um, we're, we're actually out of time, Mr. Dazang. I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up this conversation, but thank you very much. Uh, Nick Dazang is the Director of Voter Education at the Independent National Electoral Commission. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Well, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. But before then, let's see what Nigerians have to say about the Southeast's quest for a presidential seat. After that, my take. It's not yet time for Igbo to win the candidate seat, presidency seat, because they have not had the oneness, the oneness, the unity. So they, ha they don't have the material for now to work with. The moment they have the oneness, the unity, the one accord, they will rule Nigerian. They deserve it now because the system has not been fair to them. I personally am not from the Igbo states, but I personally think that they are hardworking people. You understand? Because Nigeria as it stands now, they have not been fair to them. The leadership and everything, they have been kicked aside. And I think it's high time they get their own share of what is happening in the country. Yes, I think so. Because Imo is, uh, Igbo people are more experienced than all these outsiders and Yorubas. So I think Igbo person, if you if you rule Nigeria, he will rule it better. Well, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, uh, if it is by a rotation, it is being done by rotation, if there is an agreement within both the northerners, the westerners, and the southerners, that things should be done rotationally, I mean, choosing the president of Nigeria. If the Yorubas have ruled and the northerners have ruled, if it's come to the westerners to rule, they should rule. If it, if it is the turn for the northerners to rule, they should rule. If it is the turn to the easterners, to, the, to be ruled, they should rule. If they should give a, an Hebo 
the opportunity this time. I think maybe it will be a change and uh, let's see how it goes. Time for my take. Elections in Nigeria are a far cry from what it's meant to be originally, but there seems to be hope on the horizon as we expect Mr. President to sign the Electoral Act into law. But we know that it's not just, I mean, about signing it, it's just a start. Laws in themselves are nothing if they aren't enforced. Our judiciary needs to be awake to its responsibilities. The processes must be swift and done without interference or even fear of favor. For our democracy to be strengthened and reliable, we need strong institutions, an independent judiciary, an INEC that is truly independent, the law enforcement that is, isn't afraid of the government that is in power. We need a truly fair and transparent process devoid of violence and that can allow for the right type of candidates to emerge and give us the kind of leadership that we deserve. Now, as we await 2023 with high hopes, let's make sure the needed work is done now. I am Mary Anna Cohn, thanking you for watching. Do have a good evening.